in this class. I'm assuming everyone could hear me, right? Good, okay, so we're ready to begin. <clears throat> so today we're gonna be discussing a very, very interesting topic. And it's the topic of soulmates, otherwise known in Yiddish or in Jewish vernacular as Bashert. And <clears throat> I think the question on the flyer is quite obvious. Does Judaism believe in soulmates? Uh, obviously we do. We've all heard the word hundreds of times, bashert. Sometimes the word bashert is used for other aspects of life. Like, oh, it's bashert that this good thing happened or that good thing happened. Because indeed, everything in life is bashert. Because Hashem runs the world. So everything is divine providence. Uh, to be more specific, the Talmud says that the only thing we really have control about in our lives is the things that pertain to good and bad, good and evil. Hakol bidei shemaim, everything is in the hands of heaven. Chutz miyur except fear of heaven. So the one thing that we have free choice in is our actions of good gives us free will. But other aspects of our life are mostly predetermined. And specifically when it comes to marriage, we have a belief in basharat, which means that our soulmates are predetermined. So before we get into the complicated conversation of how it works, let's just first introduce, I wanna to try to break the class into three segments. Segment number one is gonna be, what is the concept of basharat in Judaism? Then we're gonna talk about, okay, how does it work? Because I'm sure you all have a lot of questions about how it actually works. And then for those people who are uh, on the Zoom that maybe are looking for their Basharat, some practical advice how you can find your Basharat. Um, so that's the way we're gonna, we're gonna do this, okay? And by the way, I always welcome questions. Uh, you could type your question in. If it's appropriate, uh, I'll answer at that point. If not, I'll try to come back to it later. But let's start with what the concept of Basharat means. So Basharat means, as even the English expression uh, is well known, marriages are made in heaven. People often say it's a match made in heaven. Where does that come from? It comes from the Jewish concept of Bashert, that the Talmud says that 40 days before a child is born, a heavenly voice announces, Bat Ploni Le Ben Ploni, the daughter of so and so will marry the son of so and so. That's a Talmudic statement which means, according to the Talmud, every marriage, every baby, every soul that comes into this world already has a soulmate. Now, I just want to clarify the word soulmate. It's different than basher, because a mate in English, I spent two years in Melbourne, Australia, so I know the word mate. Everyone always says, hey, mate, hey, mate. A mate is like a buddy, like a best friend. He's my mate. So soulmate could mean, hey, we're two souls who are buddies, who are mates. But shared is a much, much deeper concept. And this is what I want to illustrate. The idea of a bashert is that these two souls, and this is the way the Baal Shem Tov explains it, were not just buddies, not just friends, not just compatible, not just get along nicely with each other or two pieces of a puzzle that go into one another, but much more than that, that they were originally one soul. As it says in Kabbalah, and, and there's a lot of Kabbalistic uh, teachings on this matter, and obviously I'm not a Kabbalist, so anything I'm saying is just like skimming the surface, you know, it's very deep stuff, and uh, you know, you need to go to a really someone who understands Kabbalah to understand the complexities of it. But the basic concept is, that when God created Adam and Eve, God didn't originally make two separate bodies, a man and a woman. He made one soul in one body. Now, if you ever ask yourself, was Adam's original body male or female? And more interestingly, was his soul a masculine soul or a feminine soul? 
And the answer is that we always know the story in Bereshit, in Genesis, that God took the body of Adam, put him to sleep, took one of his ribs, and fashioned another body, a woman, so he could have a companion, a friend, a partner in life. But what about the soul? A body is not alive unless it has a soul. So where did Eve get her soul from? Did God blow a new soul into Eve? The Torah doesn't say that. The Torah says God blew into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. It was only one soul put into Adam. So we know where Eve's body came from, but where did Eve's soul come from? So according to Kabbalah, Adam had, was, was a joint soul with male and female components to it. There was the masculine and the feminine part of the soul of Adam. And why is that so? Because man was created in the image of God. Adam was in the image of God. If I ask you, is God a man or a woman? Is he masculine or feminine? The obvious answer is he's both. He's all encompassing. Because if he's one or the other, he's limited. If you look at the four letters of the Tetragrammaton, Yud, Hey, Vav, K. Two of the letters are masculine, two are feminine. Even though we refer to God as, you know, he doesn't mean that he's a he versus a she. God is he and she combined, which means that the original soul of Adam was masculine and feminine. When God separated and made a separate entity because God saw that Adam was alone, he put the feminine aspects of the, the feminine components of Adam's soul into Eve, his wife while Adam retained his masculine component. So think about two halves of a whole. They complete one another. And when we say basher, it's a soulmate, it's actually more than a soulmate because soulmate means two partners, two friends, two buddies, two, 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 two people in a relationship. Bashar means it's one soul, but the man and the woman are not just mates. They're not separate entities that are mates. They're one entity. They're one complete soul when they are together. As someone once said that in Judaism, a marriage is not a union between a man and a woman. It's a reunion. The souls are coming back together. Two halves of a soul go into two bodies, a masculine and a feminine body. And they're longing and searching to be reunited again with each other. And they feel incomplete without each other. Because if you ask yourself, if you want to just throw the question a little deeper, why get married? What's the point of marriage in the first place? We live in a day and age where people could do okay on their own. You know, uh, women are independent. They earn a living. Um, in today's society, people could, you know, have all the benefits of marriage without actually being married. And many people choose that. They choose not to get married. They say, hey, I could live with this person. We could do everything we want together and enjoy all the benefits of marriage. We don't have to actually get married. Why do we need a piece of paper to say we're married, so to speak? Now, you may say, well, commitment, it gives you security. It gives you a feeling of, you know, happiness, whatever. It makes you feel um, you know, like you're in a permanent relationship, not just something that can change. And all of that is true. Oh, we're going to start a family. So we want to have a, a, a marriage to build a family on. So the children will be growing up in a home where there's a husband and a wife who are committed to each other. And all of that is true. But from a Jewish perspective, it's much deeper than that. Because marriage is what fuses the two half of the souls together. It's only the blessing of God in a marriage, as we've talked about maybe other times, the word ish and isha both have the words ish in it, alaf shin, which means fire and passion. But it's the yud of ish and the hey of isha, which is God's name, that brings the union together, that brings the two. Only God could put the two souls together. That's what the Torah says. A man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, what does one flesh mean? It doesn't, you, your two fleshes can become one. You're always going to be a, your flesh and your husband or your wife is going to be a different flesh. One flesh means you become one entity. The only way you become one entity is when your souls become one. So the Jewish concept of basheret is not just a mate, 
but someone who is the other half of your soul, just like Eve was half of Adam's soul. And therefore, from a Jewish perspective, if you don't get married, and again, it's going to raise a lot of questions here, but you don't feel complete yet because you may say, well, why do I need to get married? I'm happy on my own. And the answer is because your other half of your soul needs to come together with you so you could be the complete soul that you were originally before you descended into this world. Now, where do we find this concept in the Torah of Basheret? I told you, of course, Adam and Eve and how God made them. Originally, Adam was one person with a male and a female components. And, the, and, and according to the Talmud, there were two sides to Adam, the male side and the female side. And when it says he, God took one of his ribs, Salotav, the Zohar says it doesn't mean a rib, it means one of his sides. Took the female side and made him face to face instead of back to back, so to speak. Um, because originally the male and the female components were back to back. So where do we actually find this in the Torah? So we all know the story. The story is when Abraham needs a shidduch, needs a match for his son Isaac, he sends Eliezer, his servant, to find a girl for Isaac to marry. And we all know the story. Eliezer goes to the well and he comes with his camels and he offers a prayer to God. And he says, God, help me find the right girl for my master's uh, son, Isaac. And he, he makes a sign. What's the sign? He says, the girl who I will approach and say, please give me water for myself to drink and the girl will be so kind that she will say not only am I going to give water for you but I'm going to give water for your camels as well this is the right girl because she has the trait of chesed of kindness and that's the girl I'm looking for a kind girl but here's the question if he was looking for a kind girl it makes perfect sense Give a test. See if the girl's kind. How do you see if the girl's kind? If she goes above and beyond what she was asked for. She was asked for water for the servant, Eliezer, the man. And she says, I'll get for the camels as well. But why does that something you have to pray to God for? Just set up a test and see who passes the test. What does Eliezer mean when he says, O sahachachta? If you look in the verse, it says, when the girl will offer water for me and the camels, then I will know that this is the one asher achachta, which means that you have selected, that you have designated, that you have chosen. In other words, the fact that she passes the test may be another kind girl, but not the soulmate of Isaac. There are lots of kind girls. Maybe 10 girls were capable of passing that test, of being asked for water for the camels, and they're such kind girls that they offered, for, I'm sorry, being requested water for the servant Eliezer, and they were so kind that they would offer for the camels. There may be 10 girls in town that would do that. Eliezer was saying, first of all, send the kind girl. But it should be the girl that you chose, Asher Hochachta Labdacha, the one that you chose for my master's son. In other words, there may be a lot of wonderful people out there, but who is the one that is my soulmate? And here's right away where you see I know I'm jumping to the last segment of the class, which I said I'll talk about how to find your soulmate. Here you see right away the first answer in the Torah. The first thing to find your soulmate is pray because you need God's help in finding your proper soulmate. So that's number one. But we'll get back to that at the end of the class. But here you see this idea of soulmate that Eliezer prays to God to send the right girl. And then what happens? Rivka comes along and sure enough, Rivka passes the test. And he realizes his prayer was answered. The minute he prayed is when he got his answer. So what happens? He goes home to meet Rebecca's brother, Bituel, and father, I'm sorry, the father, Bituel, and the brother, Laban. And he tells them the story. I came to the well on a mission to find a girl for my master's son. I made this arrangement with God. I prayed to send the right girl. 
and the sign will be the girl who is kind. It's a sign that that's the one God chose. And your daughter came along, your sister, and did exactly what I said. And now will you let me take your daughter back home to marry Isaac? And if you remember the story in Bereshit, what was the response of the father and the brother of Rebecca? They said to Eliezer, we can't say anything good or bad. You're asking us permission? <laughs> what can we say? And here's the quote directly from the, word, the mouth of Rebecca's brother and father. May Hashem Yatsahadavar. This matter comes from God. This is a marriage made in heaven. This is who God deemed the right man to marry our daughter and sister. So who are we to object? Who are we to say anything? In other words, the idea of Basher is derived from this story. Eliezer sets up a test, asks God to send the right girl, the soulmate of Isaac. And sure enough, when he finds her and he says to the family, this is what happened, they say, from God, this matter came forth. This is a marriage made in heaven. This is Basher. This is the predestined one from God. So this is the biblical source or the fundamental story that shows the idea of matches made in heaven. And that's why you find something fascinating. When Isaac, when, when Eliezer leaves with Rebecca from Haran to come back to Canaan for Isaac to marry her, you look in the Torah, it says like this. It says he took her into his home and then it says he loved her. Now, normally you fall in love and then you take someone into your home after you've fallen in love. In this case, he took her into the home and then he loved her because he knew this was his soulmate and therefore he married her. And then, of course, the love came naturally within the marriage. So this is the first biblical story. You have Adam and Eve. Then you have the story of Rebecca and Isaac. But there's one other famous story. And that is, of course, the story of Jacob. Now, the question is, is there something called love at first sight? And many people you'll meet, they'll say, I saw my spouse for the first time. The minute I saw them, I just knew this was my soulmate. Okay. I've had people tell me that many, many times. I'm sure you've heard that too. Maybe you experienced that. You didn't even have to say a word to them. I, I, I'm, I saw them across the room and our eyes locked and boom, I knew. And now they're married happily married with children, but they say they knew the minute they saw each other, which is the English expression of love at first sight. Now, on the one hand, do you believe in that? How, do, how could you love somebody if you have no idea who they are? You haven't spoken one word to them. Now, you could say, well, maybe it's just physical attraction. Maybe it has nothing to do with love. Maybe it's just that you like the way they look. You know, I think Woody Allen has a story about this beautiful girl who's in an art museum looking at a painting and a guy sees her. So he wants to strike up a conversation with her. He says, uh, hi, how are you? She says, I'm good. He says to her, uh, what are you doing on Friday night? Would you like to go out? The girl says, no, I'm sorry, I messed it up. It goes like this. He says, how are you doing? She says, good. She, she's looking at an abstract painting. So he says to her, what do you see in this painting? Like he wants to have a conversation with her. She says, in this conversation, I'm sorry, in this piece of artwork, I see skeletons and skulls and blood and, and weapons. It's abstract art, you can see whatever you want. Basically, you know, she's a little, uh, a little dark, as you would say. He says to tell me, uh, what are you doing on Friday night? You available? I want to go take you out. She says, Friday night, I'm not available. He says, why not? Uh, she says, because I'm committing suicide on Friday night. This world is evil. It's a terrible place. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm, I'm going to kill myself on Friday night. He says, oh, okay. Any chance you're available Thursday night? The point is that you see someone, you say, love at first sight. What is love at first sight? Is that a fantasy or is that real? But the Torah tells us that there is something called love at first sight. Jacob sees Rachel and the minute he sees her, he starts weeping. And he gets this tremendous strength to push the rock off 
the mouth of the well for the shepherds when he sees her. And the rabbi said, why was he crying? Read the Rashi on the text. You know why he was crying? He was crying according to an opinion of Rashi because he saw right then and there that he was going to marry her. But he also saw he would not be buried with her in the cave of Machpelah because she would be buried in the tomb of Rachel. And he wept because he saw his whole future with her, but that they would not be together for eternity. So that's love at first sight. In other words, Jacob was one of those rare people who his soul was able to immediately identify their soulmate. And there are some people, and I can't explain why, maybe they have very powerful souls, maybe they have a lot of spiritual clarity in their life, Maybe they've evolved to a place, who knows, that they could just meet the person and see the person who's their soulmate. And they get this instant feeling of connection that's nothing to do with physical attraction, because there may be a lot of other attractive women in the room. They didn't choose that woman because it was the most attractive woman, or she didn't choose him because he was the most handsome guy. It was something about their look at each other that they felt. I found my soulmate. This is the person, which is unbelievable. And I told you that the Talmud says that before a baby is born, 40 days before, there's a heavenly announcement that says the, son, the, uh, the daughter of so-and-so is going to marry the son of so-and-so. But then there's another statement that has to be reconciled with this that says that marriages, making shiduchim, is as difficult for God as the splitting of the sea. The question is one minute. If, if it's all predestined, it should be very easy. We already know he's going to marry her. She's going to boom, boom, boom. Like, wh why is it as hard as the splitting of the sea? And one approach is, is okay, now go find that person. You may be living in, uh, in Canada and she may be living in America or maybe even worse. You're living in America and she's living in Australia. How are you going to get together? So God has to now figure out how to put an idea in his head to go travel to Australia on a vacation da, 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 and bump into her in a restaurant, right? And you think about what has to happen to get those two people to meet each other. And maybe God has them walking down the same street and bumping into each other, but he's on his cell phone. He doesn't even notice her, you know? Like there's a lot of things that have to, so imagine what a job that is for God. We have billions of people in the world and God has to make sure these people meet up with each other. And that's why, you know, there's a woman, Lori Polotnik. Um, she always says that on her Shabbat dinner conversations, uh, she likes to, she has these questions to jumpstart conversation at the table. And I recall one of the conversation pieces she has is, tell us your Bashert story. Everyone has their Bashert story. How did you meet your spouse? Oh, I got to tell you how this happened. It was unbelievable. And look, I could spend the next half hour telling you about shared stories. And you must probably could tell me about shared stories for the next half hour. But this is the idea that what are the chances that this boy will meet this girl and you know you come to weddings and like, how did they get together? He's from Argentina, she's from uh, Australia. Like, oh, they happen to be this and that, right? So that's what God has to arrange. Now, the one other point I wanna, before we get into how Bashert works and the questions about Bashert, on this first segment, which is the idea of what is Bashert, most important thing to remember is that when you say someone's your soulmate, it means your souls were one in heaven, right? Now think about this for a second. When you were in heaven, your soul didn't have a body. So you weren't handsome or gorgeous. You didn't have black hair or blonde hair or red hair or whatever it is. You didn't, uh, you didn't have a, a job yet. So you weren't this career or that career or whatever it is, right? You didn't have a bank account yet. You didn't have even a family yet, right? Most of the things we look at today when we want to marry someone as well, do I like the way they look physically? And now attraction is very important. I'm not minimizing attraction, but there's more to attraction than physical looks. Looks is looks, attraction is attraction. You're attracted to a person because of a chemistry with the person not just because of their looks, but to remember that your, your, your relationship began, you chose each other, you were matched for each other based on your soul's composition, not on your bodily. So a guy could meet his, his Bashert, but she's not as attractive as he would like her to be. Or she could meet uh, a guy, he's not as successful as she would like him to be. 
And she says, no, I'm not going to marry him. Without giving the person a chance to see if their soul is your soul mate, your basheret. But in heaven, all of these components weren't there. There was no level of success because he didn't earn a dollar yet. There was no attraction because he didn't have a body yet. So when we talk about a soulmate, and this really ties into the third part of the segment of the class, which is how do you find your soulmate? And we'll try to get to that later, but just remember that there's two components. There's the soul's relationship and then a lot of the physical things. You know, the famous story about this guy's in a restaurant and the waiter says, what would you like to eat? And he says, well, do you have any fish on the menu? Because I love fish. He says, yeah, we got great fish. He chooses a fish dish. The waiter goes into the restaurant and says, the guy at table number eight loves fish. Could you give him some fresh fish? So this is a very, very high-end restaurant. They go to the aquarium, they take out a fish, they put it down on the block. They take out a big, uh, you know, uh, a big wooden uh, clobber and they zets the fish over the head. The blood goes splattering all around. He cuts up the fish, debones it, puts up a frying pan with hot sizzling oil, throws some onions and throws the fish onto the frying pan. And the waiter murmurs under his breath and says, that's a pretty mean, nasty thing to do to a fish that you just proclaimed your love for. So when you say you love fish, if you love fish, you let it swim in the ocean. When you say I love fish, you mean I love eating fish. I love the taste of fish. I love the pleasure of fish. So when we say I love you, what does that mean? Does it mean I love you or I love myself? And I love the feeling I get or the joy or the pleasure or the whatever ego, uh, you know, the, the validation that you give me has nothing to do with you. Just like I love the fish has nothing to do with my love for fish. People who love fish buy it and put it in a fish tank. When you say I love steak, you let the animal, the cow live on a farm and, and enjoy pasturing in the farm. You don't kill it and eat it. You're saying I love steak. I love the pleasure of steak, not the actual steak. So I just want to point out one more thing and then we'll move on to the second segment of the class. And that is something very fascinating that illustrates this point. I don't know if you know this, but next time you go to a Jewish wedding, you could pay attention to this. The Jewish weddings are very different than non-Jewish weddings. In Jewish weddings, there are two steps to marriage. One is erosin, which is commonly translated as betrothal. And the second one is nisuin, which is translated as marriage. Now, you may say, well, that's engagement and marriage. No. It's different. Let me explain. You see, in Talmudic times, the two ceremonies were about a year apart. You know, let's say someone gets engaged today, they get married a year later. In the olden days, the engagement wasn't engagement. It was betrothal. Today, we do both under the chuppah, back to back, simultaneously, not simultaneously, but consecutively. Now, why don't we do it the way we did it in the olden days? There's different reasons given. But let's just, you know, one reason given is that they used to have two big celebrations. Today, people, you know, people at one point couldn't afford two big celebrations. So they put it together in one ceremony. So you only have to have one feast, one party. Even though today we could afford maybe to have two celebrations, we still keep it the way it was done. But what is the difference between Kiddushin and Nisuin? And next time you're at a wedding, you'll notice there's not one cup of wine. You must probably remember, how many cups of wine do we have under a wedding ceremony? Two cups of wine. The first cup of wine is to celebrate the betrothal. The second cup of wine is the marriage. Now, what is betrothal? So if someone gets engaged in modern day times, even Jewish people who get engaged, it means they've made a commitment to marry each other. Now, a commitment is very important. You made a commitment to marry somebody. But halachically, they're not married yet. And if one of the partners, God forbid, cheats on the other one, you wouldn't call that halachically infidelity. Infidelity is when you are married. 
and you were not loyal to your spouse. When you're engaged and you you're not loyal to your spouse and you 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 you're with somebody else, you're you're not an honest person, you're not a decent person perhaps, but you didn't commit infidelity because you weren't married yet. In Jewish law, once you go through the step of betrothal, which is kiddushin, now you are legally married, which means he is forbidden to any other woman and she is forbidden to any other man. And if they are with another man or woman, it's a violation of marriage. And when you look at the first blessings on the chuppah, that's what we talk about, forbidden unions. And then the second step is, okay, now that we're married and forbidden to anyone else, we're still not allowed to come together as husband and wife. We're not allowed to be intimate with each other. The second step is nisuin, where now you become husband and wife. Now, why does Judaism break it into two steps? And the answer is because there's two parts to marriage. There's the spiritual connection, which is like the first part. We are husband and wife. We're connected to each other. Although we physically don't have any benefits of marriage, we're not living together yet. We live, the bride and the groom would live in their parents' homes for a year. We're not physically married. We're spiritually married. We've connected on the, we've reunited spiritually. And then a year later, we'll come together and live as a husband and wife and have the physical benefits of marriage as well. The companionship, the friendship, the love, the intimacy, all of that. But it's delineating two aspects of marriage. And one has to come before the other. You see, in many cases in modern society, people right away jump into a physical relationship. So they put the physical relationship before the spiritual relation. Then after they're physically attached, they want to start developing a spiritual relationship with each other. As opposed to Judaism says, first establish the spiritual connection without anything physical. And then down a year later or some period later, you actually come together as a husband and wife. But remember that the physical relationship was predicated on the spiritual one first. So that, that's the concept of a soulmate of a basher. Again, if you have any questions, feel free. I see we have some questions here, maybe. Oh, no. Okay. So now we're going to come to the next question. And this is the hardest part of the class because this is stuff that we don't really have all the answers to. Uh, we have insights from our Kabbalistic teachings, but it's, it's, it's not easily understood. And the question is, okay, I got it. We believe in Bashar as a soulmate. Beautiful, right? But that leaves a lot of unanswered questions. First question is, does that mean I have no free choice in who I want to marry? I mean, we think about the biggest decision we make in our life is who we marry. And you're telling me now that I don't get to choose that. It's already predestined. God already determined that. Where's my free choice in determining who I'm going to marry? Second question is, what happens if everyone has a soulmate? Why are there so many people that are not married yet? Why didn't God bring them together with their soulmates? Number three, why do so many people get divorced? If God put me together with my soulmate, why, am I, why are we divorced? And the questions, as you could imagine, could go on and on and on. What happens, God forbid, if someone's spouse passes away and they remarry? Does that mean that they're not married to their soulmate anymore, right? Because their soulmate was their first marriage, perhaps. And what happens when a Jewish person marries a non-Jewish person? Was that their soulmate, a non-Jewish person? The Torah says you shouldn't marry a non-Jew. So how does that work? And obviously the questions go on and on and on and become very difficult to understand how the concept of Bashert works. And not only does it, is it difficult from a understanding how it works from a pragmatic way, there are things in the Torah that seem to contradict the idea of Bashert. I showed you what supports Bashert, but we all know the law in Deuteronomy and Shoftim if a soldier is engaged, betrothed, by the way, as I just explained, he's, he's already made a, not just a commitment, but got married to someone, but didn't do the second part, which is nisuin. What does the Torah say? The Torah says the general would say, who is the man who planted a vineyard and didn't eat from the fruit? Let him go home, lest he die in battle, and someone else will eat the fruit of the vineyard. Who is the man who built a home but didn't dedicate it? Let him go home. 
leave the battlefield, lest he die in battle, and another man will live in a dedicated his house. And then the general would say, Mi ha'isha sher eras ishto. Who is the man who betrothed a woman but did not marry her yet? Let him go home from the battlefield. Let him not stay in the battlefield. Why? Pen yamud ba'milchama, lest he die in battle, and another man will marry her. One minute. This is Maimonides' question. How could that be? If this woman who he's betrothed to is his soulmate, then how could it be that he'll die in battle and another man will marry her? It's not that man's soulmate. It's his soulmate. He's already betrothed to her. And so how could he die in the battle and how could another man marry him? So there's a lot of questions about Bashar. And furthermore, even the Talmudic expressions seem to contradict each other. Because on the one hand, you say God announced in heaven on the other hand, you say it's as difficult as the splitting of the sea. And here's where there's a lot of different answers provided in Kabbalah. And we'll try to give um, a couple of approaches to this question. And, and just to throw in one more question into the mix. And that is, what's if someone is not divorced, but they're having difficulty in their marriage? They're seeing a, a marriage counselor. They're struggling. And they're saying to me, so one minute, I was supposed to marry my soulmate. Doesn't feel like my soulmate. Why are we having so many challenges if this is my soulmate? I thought God's giving me my soulmate. Bashert. So how do you explain so many unhappy marriages if... You're married to your soulmate. So I'm just piling up the questions before we take some of the approaches. So the first thing we have to know is that, yes, God has a predestined soul for every person, but God does not take away your free choice. Prior and within marriage, what does that mean? I asked you a question. What happens if someone marries out of the faith? Was that their predestined so obviously not because the torah says you should marry someone who's jewish so clearly that wasn't your soulmate but god's not going to take away your free will in choosing whether you're going to perform the commandment of marrying someone within the faith let's say you're you have your predestined soul but you meet that person and you decide, man, eh, they're not attractive enough for me, or they don't make as enough money as I would like them to make, or some other reason you decide not to marry them. So God gave you the free will to marry your soulmate. God will always present you with the opportunity to marry your soulmate, but God will not compel you or force you to do it. At the end of the day, you have free choice. So is every person necessarily married to their soulmate? Absolutely not. Because then that would mean you don't have free choice. The fact is, as I said, people could make choices not based on what is right for their soul, but what could be many other reasons why people make choices. And this is, by the way, a bigger challenge today maybe than ever before, because we live in a generation where we have so many different uh, influences on people, especially young people, social media and marketing and, uh, you know, romantic movies and books that the image that someone has of who their soulmate is going to be has to be what they saw in the movies, like romantic movies. So they may meet a guy and like, oh, I don't feel fireworks. I'm not smitten. I'm not romantically. It wasn't love at first sight. And or maybe they don't look the way they're supposed to look in the fashion magazines or whatever it is, or they don't drive a fancy enough car for me. And they're influenced by that. And they may be missing the opportunity to marry their soulmate. Because Hashem does not take away your free will who you're going to marry. Now, I said this applies before marriage and within marriage, because we raise the question if if. if if you marry your soulmate, if when I stood under the chuppah, I was with my bashert, why am I having trouble in my marriage? Or God forbid, why am I getting divorced? And the answer is, again, the, the, 
God chose your soulmate for you, but you still have a free will to be a good spouse. You know, someone said marriages are made in heaven, but they have to be kept on earth. So in other words, if, if you, the man or the woman chooses to act in an immoral way, for example, or if the man or the woman chooses to act in a selfish way or self-centered way or whatever it may be, and they corrode their marriage because of their actions. It's not because you're not with your soulmate. It's because you've not developed yourself and evolved to be the soul mate that you were destined to be your soul in heaven was not self-centered and egotistical and arrogant and temperamental and all the different things that may arise in a marriage or unfaithful right that's your bodily condition that you developed and became and you have a choice how to be within the marriage so it could very well be that this was your soulmate, but you forfeited it or destroyed it through your actions, although it was the, your intended soulmate. So just because a couple gets divorced, it doesn't mean they weren't with their soulmates. It could be they just didn't merit to fulfill their mission and destiny to be soulmates. But furthermore, and this is another important point, let's say a couple struggling in a marriage and they're having challenges. Does that mean, oh, clearly I'm not with my soulmate because if it was with my soulmate, it would just be happily ever after. It would be all bliss. And the answer is no, because who said marriage was created? Of course, marriage is created so we should have happiness and fulfillment and connection and love. And it's a very deep, essential connection that no one else in the world can give you except your spouse. But there's also the challenges of marriages that are placed there for you to grow. For you, the whole, the real purpose of marriage is growth. God gives you a person that you could do the most growing with. And that's the number one priority. And, you know, again, the notion that I'm looking for someone that I could be the most comfortable with, you know, going back to Bereshit, it says God made a helpmate opposite Adam, Kinegdo. And our rabbis point out that, Sometimes the role of the wife or the husband is to oppose their spouse. So if your spouse wants to do something that's not good or not right, should you just say, oh, I want to be a good spouse, let them do whatever they want? Or should you try to get them to change course? Well, there's going to be a little bit of friction if you uh, stand up and oppose your spouse. But maybe that's the growth that that person needs to do within marriage. So soulmate doesn't necessarily mean that you um, never experience challenges within your marriage. This may be why your souls were predestined so you could each develop and evolve to the best possible version of who you are. And hopefully when you look at your marriage, you could say it's made me a better person because anytime you're in a relationship with someone, you're going to have to think a little bit less about yourself and more about the other person as well. And then God willing, when you have children, it becomes more about others. And you, you develop the most altruistic version of yourself. So once again, uh, there's always free will about who you're going to marry. And you could choose to marry the person who is not your uh, soulmate, even though God gave you the opportunity to do that. And then within marriage, there is the freedom of choice as well, how to act, how to behave to be worthy of your soulmate. You have to merit to marry your soulmate and you have to merit to be happily married to your soulmate. And therefore, it's something that is a blessing, but the opportunity is given to you, but you have to make that choice. God is not going to force you into a relationship with someone that you're not choosing to be with. And therefore, soulmates is not a given or a guarantee. It's more of an ideal, that ideally we strive to marry our soulmates. But, and, and if you didn't marry your soulmate, let's say you didn't choose the right person. Does that mean you're doomed? No, it doesn't mean you can't be happy with someone else as well. It just means you didn't reach your perfect ideal marriage. You didn't merit to be with that one person who is your true soulmate. And now you could be happily married as well 
but maybe not achieve the full potential that you could have had you chosen the right soulmate. So this is something we have to keep in mind. But let me just throw in one more thing, um, or two more things, actually. And this is getting Kabbalistic. So again, it's a little bit above my pay grade here. But just that you know these concepts um, exist. In the Talmud, it talks about, the Torah talks about a king, that a king is not allowed to have too many wives. Lo yarbe lo nashim. In the olden days, obviously, a man was allowed to marry more than one wife. We're not going to get into that conversation right now, why that was, but that's the way it was. Even our patriarchs, of course, we know um, Jacob had Rachel and Leah. That's why we have three patriarchs and four matriarchs. But in the olden days, kings would take many wives. Sometimes that had to do with treaties. When they would make a treaty with a country to show the treaty was uh, a peaceful treaty, they would marry someone from that country, uh, a princess or something. Having said that, King David had the maximum amount of wives allowed by the Torah. The Torah doesn't say how many, but the Talmud derives from the verses that, anyone want to guess the number? King David married 18 wives. King Solomon violated that commandment. He took a thousand wives. But King David fulfilled it, 18 wives. And here's a very interesting Kabbalistic concept, and it's brought down in the holy books. And that is that it's not that every person has one soulmate. Every person has 18 different soulmates. Now, King David married every one of his soulmates to fulfill the full potential of his soul. King David wrote the book of Psalms. He was not just the king. He was the greatest lover of God. And he fulfilled his ultimate spiritual destiny by marrying all 18 of his soulmates. Now, you and I, we live in a post. Cheron Rabbeinu Gershon said you could only marry one woman. So we each have one spouse, at least at a time, right? If God forbid someone gets divorced or loses their spouse, they may remarry. But that doesn't mean the second person is not your soulmate either. Every person has 18 different people who are all, so to speak, in the same bracket of their soulmate. And any one of those 18 people could be their soulmate. Again, this is not, this is Kabbalah, okay? I could give you the sources for it if you want to delve deeper into it. But the point is, now we understand why on the one hand it's announced who they're going to marry. But on the other hand, it's as difficult as the splitting of the sea because it's always, you know, the Talmud says, what does God do since he created the world? And the Talmud answers, he is matching people up. Why is it so difficult to match people up? Because what happened if this person, you know, came together with this other person but chose not to marry them for whatever reason? So then there's option number B soulmate now the b option is not as good as the a option and the c option is not as good as the b option and the d option is not as good so it gets less and less perfect so to speak in the ideal perfect soulmate but the first choice for whatever reason maybe the person you are destined to marry chose to not get married they decided they don't want to get married so does that mean you're stuck for the rest of your life because your soulmate decided not to get married so according to this idea, there's a second potential match for you. And then a third one up until 18. And so with each one of the people, billions of people, God's working things out where they should have the first choice. If that doesn't work out for whatever reason. Someone, you know, one, one, one soul came into this world and became a very responsible, diligent, hardworking, evolved human being. And the other guy became a frat boy, just goes to parties every day. And now when they, they, they meet up at 25 years old, they're not compatible anymore. Why? Because one led a very noble, a righteous lifestyle. And one led a very hedonistic lifestyle. And they look at each other. They meet up when they're 25 and like, you're not for me. I'm not for you. Clearly, uh, I'm on one trajectory in life. You're on a different trajectory. So, OK, we got to go to plan B then. Who's the next potential soulmate for you? Because we all have choices how to lead our lives. Just because in heaven, two souls were compatible and they were soulmates doesn't mean the choices they make in this world is going to keep them compatible till they get to the point when they meet each other and are ready to get married. So there's so many different factors that are, so to speak, moving targets and evolving situations. And therefore, there's, according to, based on this idea of King David, up until 18, 
different potential soulmates. And that's the idea with the soldier on the battlefield. Yes, if he dies, someone else, the, another soulmate of that wife may marry him. Not that the wrong soulmate will marry him, but rather a different potential soulmate. Um, there's also a lot of different questions uh, just to show the complexity. We believe in Judaism. We had another class about this and reincarnation. What happens if two souls come up to heaven and one has to be reincarnated and the other one doesn't? One finished their journey and the other one has to go back down again. Well, how are they going to get married if their soulmate was not reincarnated? So you understand that there has to be multiple uh, choices uh, and multiple potential soulmates. So to not, uh, you know, it sounds very romantic. Everyone has a soulmate. Some people are meritorious. They, 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 they're fortunate that they meet their true bashert and that's who they're married to. Other people may be not be as fortunate. They may have to marry choice number two, a choice number three, a choice number four. So there's so many complex factors and think of bashert more as the perfect ideal that we should merit to be the type of person that when our soulmates meet us, they should see within us all the qualities that make us worthy of being their soulmate. And we should have the perception to see our soulmates, not for any external superficial materialistic things, but look into their neshama and say, is this the person who is my soulmate, not just someone who's going to give me physical enjoyment and pleasure in life. So it's something you have to be worthy of. And that takes us to the last segment, which is how do you find your bashert? There are so many people looking for their bashert. And, and how do you go about finding them? And I think some of the answers are clear from what we discussed. The first thing is you need Hashem's help. Going back to the story of Eliezer, the first thing he does is he prays to God. He says, God, help me find the right girl for, for, for Isaac. It's not something I can do on my own. We always feel the pressure. Oh, I have to get married. I have to find my soulmate. You do have to do your part, but you need Hashem's help. And therefore, there's a, a Yiddish expression when sometimes when a couple gets engaged and it's a beautiful wedding and, and people say to the parents or to, or to the bride and the groom, there's a Yiddish expression. I grew up hearing it. Do as good gedavent. When you do a good shidduch, you say, oh, you prayed well. In other words, it's a prayer that God answers that you should merit and deserve to meet your bashert, because like I said, your bashert could be on a different continent. And you're asking Hashem to bring you together. Or your bashert could be right in front of your eyes, but you don't have the wisdom or the ability to see that this is your bashert standing right in front of you. So you're saying, Hashem, if the person's right in front of me, open my eyes that I should see there by my bashert and not dismiss that person for the wrong reasons. And if the person's on a different continent, find a way to bring us together. So it's so important to recognize Hashem's hand in the marriage and bringing you together with your bashert. And if someone's dating, you know, Hashem, make me worthy to be the soul. If this person's my soulmate, help me be the type of person that will be worthy of marrying uh, my, my, uh, my soulmate as well. Another thing um, is when we talk about soulmates, is how to find your soulmate is having the right expectations, which is what we talked about earlier. Um, you know, I, I'll never forget the story that Rabbi, that Rabbi Sin Esther Young Grace told at the Palm Beach Synagogue once. She did a lot of matches at Hineni, a lot of Shidduchim. And she said she was once talking to this very wonderful Jewish girl who was a, an anchor woman on a TV station, very successful attractive, wonderful girl. And he, she said to him, she, she said to her, why aren't you married? I'm like, what's going on? You're ready. I don't know, 35. Why aren't you married? And she said, Rebetzin, I'm looking for the three B's. She said, three B's. Well, what are the three B's? So she, th this girl said, I'm looking for. Said, I'm, she told it that it was a girl, but it could go either way, obviously. She said, I'm looking for the three Bs. What are the three Bs, she said. 
So the, the girl says, I'm looking for brains. I'm looking for bucks, somebody with money. And I'm looking for beauty, a good looking person. He has to be beautiful, right? So you think about a lot of people today, what are they looking for? They're looking for looks, looking for money, and somebody maybe who's smart. Brains, bucks, and beauty. And the Rebetzin said to her, I want you to know your three Bs are three zeros. Why? She said, it says in Pirkei Avot, what's the most important quality that any person could possess? And Pirkei Avot says, it's a lave tov, a good heart. So the Rebetzin said to this girl, your three Bs are three zeros. Because if you don't have the number one priority, which is the lave tov, before it, it's just three zeros. If you have a lave tov, then the one turns the three zeros into a thousand. But without the number one thing, which is a good heart, it's just three zeros. Why? She went, he went on to say, because if the man you marry has brains, but he doesn't have a good heart, he's just going to use his brains to control you, to manipulate you, to outsmart you, to, you know, to, 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 to you know, be able to use his mind to control you. If he doesn't have a good heart, he'll use, again, his money, he'll use it to, again, to, to control you. If he doesn't have a good heart, he'll use his good looks uh, in a way that's inappropriate because he doesn't have a good heart and he'll, he won't be faithful to you maybe or he'll make you jealous or things like that. He said, but if he has a good heart, he has the number one, then he'll use his brains to be a wonderful husband. And he uses his money to take care of you. And he'll use his looks to, to make you happy. But the most important thing is the number one before, which is the lave tov. So what are people's expectations? A lot of people today, they're not married, right? Now, sometimes it's because they have the wrong priorities. And again, I'm not judging anyone, God forbid, and I'm not blaming anyone for being single. That's not what I'm saying, God forbid. But every person has to say to themselves, first of all, is what I'm looking for realistic? Because sometimes you can meet people who are single and they're looking for a fantasy that doesn't exist. I'm looking for someone who's gorgeous. Okay, have you looked in the mirror? Are you like uh, the most beautiful person? Like, why do you think you deserve the most gorgeous girl when you're maybe not the most handsome guy, right? Or whatever it is. I'm, I, in any area, be a little humble and don't think, sometimes people think that you know, they're deserving of everything and they have many opportunities to get married, but they keep on passing up wonderful opportunities because they're waiting for Mr. Right or whatever it may be based on a fantasy in the movies, what that is. So having, yeah, it's okay to have what we call deal breakers, right? Oh, well, obviously I'm an educated person. I, I'm not going to marry someone who I have a PhD. I'm not going to marry someone who's a high school dropout because I'm not going to be able to respect that person if they don't have a high school diploma and I, I have a PhD, that, that makes sense, you know, and there may be other things that are essential things, but you have to be more open, so to speak, in, in other areas and, and, and more realistic, so to speak, sometimes. And I would say one other problem in our society is that, you know, people get married because they want to fulfill a need in their lives. Um, and, I, you know, if you look in the religious community, you know, marriages go a lot easier, okay? Um, not that there aren't a fair share of difficulties in the religious community, but generally speaking, it's not as difficult. You know, in a religious community, sometimes there's three, four weddings in a night that, you know, uh, you got to go to the, the, this wedding, then I got to run over to that wedding. People are getting married right now. Right now, no one's getting married because it's the days of the Omer, but... In a religious community, there's multiple weddings every night. People have large families, you know, and kids are getting married. You don't hear so many stories of people getting on in age and not getting married and all of that. And, and it seems to go a lot easier. And especially because they're not in the same schools with boys and girls. It all has to be, they can't just meet each other in, in a bar or a restaurant. Boys and girls don't interact. But I think it's precisely because of that. In other words, today, people are getting all the benefits of marriage without being married. So why should I make a commitment? You know, I could, I could, I could pretend I'm married by being with, you know, multiple partners and, and all of that. And 
forget about the physical relationship, right? I have girlfriends. If I'm lonely, I could hang out with, with, uh, with, with a friend of mine who's a girl. I could get emotional. I, I, when, you, when you're in, in a platonic relate, you know, and, and you're not in a relationship with so many different girls and things like that, and, and discussing things maybe that are inappropriate and things like that, so you have more of a need to get married because you feel that loneliness more because you're, you're, you don't have a whole circle of girlfriends as a guy or a girl doesn't have a whole circle of boyfriends that she could hang out with and talk to and do other things with. So there's more of a need to get married. So I think that living a more uh, uh, modest life, when I say modest, I mean mo the laws of modesty and, and, and not... Uh, doing what a lot of people do today, which is um, have all these relationships in and out of different relationships, which only confuses a person and makes them more difficult to really find their true soulmate, A, because it's the wrong priorities of what matters, but also because I have access to so many different people that it's hard for me to really make a commitment to one person. And I don't have that much of a, the same level of motivation to want to do that. And the last thing I would say about finding your soulmate, if you're looking for your soulmate, is while you're waiting, the most important thing you could do is work on yourself. In other words, okay, if I'm going to meet my soulmate, I want to be the best person for my soulmate when I meet my soulmate. So if I have this time now, God gave me more time and I haven't found my soulmate yet, then I want to develop my personality. I want to become the, the kindest, the most, you know, thoughtful, the most, you know, selfless person I could become so that when I meet my soulmate, I'll be the, I'll be able to connect with them and I'll be worthy of, of meeting them. And that's what people should, if, if they've given this time, they should work on themselves to be ready. It's like if, if someone's coming over to your house, right? A guest. And you're waiting for the guest. You prepare the home to make it beautiful for the guest. And if the, the guest is running late, it means you have more time to get the house ready, to get the bedroom ready for the guest, get it right. The way you should look at it is my soulmate is out there. My soulmate is alive somewhere in the world, right? Because if I'm 30 years old, my soulmate has to be in this world born already. They're out there. They're just, they're, they're running a little late. They haven't gotten here yet. So that just gives me more time to get myself ready. So when they arrive, everything's beautiful. They're, I'm ready for them. And to think about your soulmate as someone who exists and is living somewhere, maybe around the corner from you, maybe at the other end of the world. And, you know, when you pray for your soulmate, don't just pray for yourself. Hashem, send me my soulmate. Hashem, send my soulmate her soulmate so she can find me because she's looking for me as much as I'm looking for her. So Hashem, help her as well or help him find their soulmate, which is me. So therefore, you're thinking about that person, you're preparing for that person, you're, you're praying for that person. And it's almost like, you know, even before you met them, you could have some kind of a relationship with them in that you're caring about them and praying for them. And that it's not just for your fulfillment and happiness, but for their fulfillment and happiness, because they're looking for you as much as you're looking for them. And so Hashem should bless both of you to find one another. So... Yes, we believe in Basharat. Is it something that, you know, is the traditional idea that there's only one soulmate? Yes, in a perfect world, you meet your soulmate. But a lot of souls are reincarnated today. Maybe your soul was married to its perfect soulmate in a previous life. And in this life, it's not your perfect soulmate. Or maybe you are uh, married to your perfect. Maybe you know your perfect soulmate. You're just not proposing uh, or not willing to to go forth because you have to reach you have to look at your your values and your priorities of what you're looking for in a spouse is it really the important things or are they superficial things and maybe you're in a marriage with your soulmate but you're having challenges not because they're not your soulmate but because this is the growth you have to go through in this world so as you can see on the one hand it's a very fundamental principle of Jewish belief on the other hand we're not exactly sure 100 percent how it works we need a lot of kabbalistic insights. As, as much as saying that a person could have up to 18 different soulmates. Um, but whatever it is, when if you stand, if you're blessed to stand under the chuppah, 
when you stand under the chuppah, then you should believe wholeheartedly that Hashem did bring me together with my soulmate. And that's the, the ideal and the most important thing is to merit to live with shalom bias, with peace and harmony, because that's when God dwells and blesses the marriage and to merit to be able to be worthy of each other, that you should always realize your marriage is a soul connection, uh, not a physical connection. First and foremost, it's a spiritual soulmate connection because your souls were connected on a spiritual level before you come together on a physical level. So thank you all for joining. Let me just see if there's any comments. Oh, okay. If anyone has any questions, we could take a minute or two if anyone wants to pose a question in the chat box. And uh, if not, then I wish everyone a lot of success. If you're not married and you're looking for your soulmate, uh, whether it's the first marriage or a second marriage, Hashem should grant everyone the blessings of finding their true bashert. And if you're in a marriage and maybe not feeling like this is your true soulmate, Hashem should bless you to be able to see each other through the eyes of your soul and recognize your connection to each other and uh, be worthy and uh, meritorious to live with your soulmate. Okay, thank you all and have a wonderful rest of the day.